welcome to another episode of Lexitecture, a podcast about words by word nerds and for you. My name is Ryan, and in each episode, my friend Amy and I will be talking about our two favorite words of the week, looking at their origins and history, and generally chatting about how they got to where they are today. If that sounds like your cup of tea, come along for the ride and let's explore the weird and wonderful world of the English language. On today's episode, garlic ginger. So we do some words for the first time in forever. Let's do some words. Let's do some words. I should, uh, I should say that just, um, as a matter of podcasting housekeeping, uh, apologies for the long wait for people who, for people who surprisingly enough have noticed the long wait. Uh, yeah, gotta... we were really amazed and, and quite gratified that people had noticed that we were gone. Yeah, a delightful email from uh, Annie who said that she missed us dearly. And then I put up a, a post on Twitter saying we were going to be recording episodes and got uh, a shocking, I mean, not shocking in the wide world of multiple thousands of retweets and stuff. We got like, I think four retweets and eight likes on the tweet that says we were coming what? back, but that's a lot. That's for, huge, dude. For us, so yeah, it was pretty cool. You um, you, you remember how I don't really understand how Twitter works, yeah? <laughs> yeah. So eight people just, liked just, it, and, and four people echoed keep, it. Just keep keep it simple. Keep it simple. Yes. It's it's good. Yeah. It was neat. It was encouraging and uh, edifying, which was which was cool. Yeah. Okay. Word me. Yes. Okay. So. Um. I think I was sort of falling into this trap. I think, uh, towards the end of I guess what has now become our first season, because there was enough <laughs> of a break. Um, I think what was bugging me, I was having trouble, more and more trouble finding words to talk about. And I think what I was doing was I was overcomplicating it for myself, and I was setting a bar quite high for what I considered a word that was worthy of discussion. Have you been in my head over the last couple of weeks? And so I've decided uh, to go back to the roots, so to speak, which is a pun that you'll hey. notice later. Um, and just because the reason, I, the thing that I thought when I came up with the idea for doing this was just that it's kind of fun to find these words that you don't really think about because they're so mundane and commonplace. Yes. And then these little gems of, that's an interesting little truth nugget. So I have decided to uh, lower my standards by raising my standards in considering all words equally interesting, even if they're relatively short as far as their descriptions go and stuff. So on that note, uh, my word today is garlic. Oh my God, this is so exciting. (laughs) You're going to be super excited when you hear what my word is. That's all I'm going to say. I'm already really excited. Okay, So one of the things Tell me about garlic. One of the things I like about learning other languages to the meager extent that I have learned them is finding, discovering etymologies in a language that I'm only just learning. Yes. So uh, in Korea, there would be these weird, these neat little things about the way Korean words are constructed that I found very cool. So uh, a strawberry, strawberry in Korean is dalgi. And to everyone who notices that I'm crap at pronouncing that, I'm sorry. So dalgi is strawberry and san is mountain. You do know that. You, you do know that if any Korean people listen to this podcast, they are currently emailing to correct your pronunciation. Oh, yeah, all of them. Regardless of the fact that you said, I'm sorry, my pronunciation isn't any good, Korean people have got some high standards for pronunciation. They do have very high standards for pronunciation. They're probably emailing me right now and don't even know why. They don't okay. even listen. Dalgi san. Um, Apologies. But, for, but uh, raspberry in Korean is san dalgi. So, Mountain strawberry. Mountain strawberry. Which is neat. Oh, lovely. And in French, for instance, the French for potato is pomme de terre, which is oh, I love this apple so much, of yeah. the earth, right? That's a very cool thing. So I've always kind of found those neat about other languages and thought that's a cool thing about languages that aren't English, that they have mm. these interesting constructions. Turns out garlic is like that because <gasps> garlic is a compound word, an old English compound word. So it's been around forever. Uh, oh, it dates back to like is, the this is so great. 11th, 12th centuries are the first sort of OED usage, but Old English. It's an Old English word itself made up of two other Old English words. Gar, as in uh, like a gar fish, a long, uh, long freshwater fish, okay. very slender and pointed. Um, so named because gar is the Old English word for a spear or a javelin. Oh, lovely. And... The lick 
in garlic is an abbreviation and a kind of an adaptation of leek, the kind of um, vegetable in the onion family, like a leek, yes. L-E-E-K. And so garlic is an old English word for a spear leek. It's just basically that's what they were calling it as a spear leek because the clove, a garlic clove, resembles, if you look at it in profile, uh, the head of a spear. This is so great. And so they, that was the word for garlic was like mountain strawberry for raspberry in Korean or apple of the earth for potato in French. Garlic was a speared leek. And it's interesting oh. that leek is that old. Like leek is apparently one of these proto-vegetables, I guess. <laughs> because there's a very... It is the filling in the pie. It is. There's a... Which is... A, Gross sounding pie first. Um, leek pie? Mm, yeah. Yeah. But it it's, needs some kind of chicken, ham, and leek pie. Yes, I can it, get that. Leek needs partners. It's not good on its own. <laughs> it's so, but leek, the word for leek, it, it has variants in basically all of the Germanic languages Old Norse, Old High German, uh, Dutch, Danish, like all of these, Saxon, all these German languages have a word for leek that is basically the same as all the other ones. And the OED says there are no, <laughs> there are just no, it, it stops there. It's a Germanic word, purely Germanic word for this, okay. ob, what was obviously just a staple food, a staple crop for the Germanic people in Northern Europe. But that's, yeah, fairly simple. That's my word. That's garlic. Spear leek. Spear leek. That is so great. Yeah. I, I, I do recall hearing when we lived in Korea, Catherine told us that, I think she she had read Shogun, you know, the, the Japanese yep. novel, sort of, uh, which, if I'm not mistaken, was probably made in a TV series. But yeah, apparently so. in the novel, the, the Japanese sort of nickname for Korean people translates to garlic eaters. Oh, that's interesting. Which, of course, makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense, yeah. The, the staple food of Korea is kimchi, which is made with tons of garlic. Yeah. And I also recall a visiting, one of Catherine's friends visiting from the UK and saying, oh yeah, when you arrive here, everybody stinks of garlic. You know, you, you notice very quickly that everyone smells of garlic. Whereas we had no idea that we all smelled of garlic because everybody else did too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I'm fond of, I'm fond of the alliums, which is the family that, that garlic belongs to. Mm -hmm. So, as far as I'm aware, leek is an allium, an onion, and garlic, and anything sort of oniony. Yeah. Anything sort of pungent and, and strong smelling like that. A spear leek. Oh, yeah. that's so great. It's a very cool thing. Oh. I like that. Well, I approve entirely of this back to basics approach. I also had a bit of a. I found myself. I think the longer you have to think about something, the bigger it becomes in your head. Yeah. And the, if, if you're a human being like me, it tends to get really complicated and bizarre. And I have had eventually got to the point where I was like, well, there are no words good enough for me to talk about anymore. We may have to cancel the podcast because <laughs> yeah. I just can't think of a single thing. And then I, I decided to do a little bit of an investigation into it. Well, here's the thing. Before this podcast, I had never heard of Proto-Indo-European. Right. And Proto-Indo-European, or pie, as we often mention, is it's just so, so freaking interesting. Yeah. I really, really enjoy the fact that, that this single language once existed and that we can kind of guess at what it may have looked like. But one of the things that really fascinates me about Proto-Indo-European is the, the spread of languages which fit into the Indo-European group. And one of the ones that most blows my mind is Sanskrit. Mm. So... Sanskrit and English come from a common ancestor, ultimately. Right. And it, it just, it seems to me so incredibly bizarre that that should be the case. Firstly, because there's a whole lot of geography in between English speaking and Sanskrit speaking places. Yeah. However, it, it's also because of what I do, because I'm a yoga teacher, I've come across Sanskrit. Mm. And the great irony there is I'm actually trained in a style of yoga that isn't huge on Sanskrit there are some styles of of yoga that attach greater importance to the sort of the traditional lineage of yoga 
And for those guys, Sanskrit is a big deal. And you need to know all the names of all the poses in Sanskrit to teach within that style. Whereas in forest yoga, we have poses like frog belly down, because you look like a frog lying with your belly down. <laughs> right. And, um, you know, bow over the roll, because you're in bow pose and you're using a roll to do it. You know, it, thing, things have been del deliberately have been made simple so that Sanskrit isn't a barrier to anybody who wants to practice yoga. So naturally enough, because someone has said to me, no, you don't have to bother learning Sanskrit. I find it very interesting. Yeah. And one of the things that I particularly like about it is it's very beautiful in translation because Sanskrit words tend to be difficult to translate. So the, the first time I recall becoming aware of Sanskrit as a thing was when I was an undergraduate studying English and we were reading The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, which ends with Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Now, if, if you know anything about kind of New Age yoga speak stuff, mm -hmm. you will be aware that Om is important and Shanti is important. But T.S. Eliot translates Shanti in his footnotes to the poem by saying the usual translation given to this word is that of the Christian teaching, peace that passeth all understanding. Mm -hmm. However, there's lots more to it than that. So Eliot makes the point of saying that this is a bit of an inadequate translation, which to me is absolutely mind-blowing because the peace that passeth all understanding is quite a complex notion. Yeah, that's a fairly grand transact or translation to give to a word. Yeah, yeah, precisely. And, and Eliot's saying... Yeah, ex like that, but more. Wow. <laughs> so, this is all a little bit incidental to the fact that the word I'm going to talk about today is ginger. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so, we have ourselves two very, very wonderful ingredients that form the base of lots of dishes that I really love to oh, eat. the start of a fantastic Thai chicken dish of some sort. Mm, yeah, or any... Or pretty much any, any fantastic kind of dish. Curry. Yeah. Uh, kimchi. There, there are garlic and ginger. You know, that things are going to be good when you start with garlic and ginger. Absolutely. So the, the reason that I got to ginger, the reason I found it was because I, f I found myself in this slightly, ugh, don't know what word I'm going to look at. I thought, well, what about words that have come into English via Sanskrit? Hmm. There's an interesting place to start. So I discovered that ginger is one of these words. Or is it? Hmm. <laughs> nice. Well crafted. <laughs> so... Etym Online has to say this about ginger, the noun. Mid-14th century, it's, it first appears, from Old English, gingifer, which, no offence ginger, but it's a much cooler word. Yeah. Or gingiber, same. From late Latin, gingiber, from Latin, zingiberi, from Greek, zingiberis. Okay. From Praktic, which is a Middle English language, singabera, from Sanskrit, Sringaveram from Sringam horn plus vera body, so called mm. from the shape of its root. Right. So, according to Etym Online, horn root, horn body is the, the kind of original place that we get this word ginger from. But to, 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 this may be Sanskrit folk, folk etymology. Now, you know, we love the folk et etymology around these parts. Love it. So the the definition on Etym Online goes on. It goes on in an interesting way for several reasons. First of all, it references a language that I've never heard of before, that I assumed was an ancient, extinct, obsolete language. And it's not. Oh. The Dravidian language. So think Davidian and then put an R between the D and the A. Mm -hmm. Dravidian. So... The Dravidian word that pr that produces the Malayam name for ginger, which is inshiver, is inshi means root. So okay. it seems that the root has always been the important part of, of the plant right. in terms of what do we call it? What What is this thing? So, yeah, very interesting to, to find that it, it has come to us from Sanskrit and, and, you know, via all these other languages. However, it makes sense that People in Asia, roughly speaking, are naming this thing because it certainly doesn't grow around these parts. Yeah, that's true. And, 
you know, when you consider how does a language come to influence both Sanskrit and English, spices are probably a pretty good, you know, there's a good chance that spices will form a part of that story somewhere along the line because of the incredible importance of spices yeah. to not just language, but culture and geography and, and all different kinds of things. Well, world if you economics. Ever want a massive, yeah, if, you, if you ever want a massive rabbit hole to Wikipedia yourself down, just you know, take a look at spices. It's mm-hmm. such an interesting place to go. So given that Etymon Online says this may be Sanskrit folk etymology, I thought, well, okay, let's get ourselves to the big guns. What does the OED have to say about it? Mm-hmm. So, etymologically, we have the word ginger comes to us from post-classical Latin gingiver. So, same thing. Lots of different spellings and variations of gingiver or gingiber. Okay. Middle French, apologies for my terrible French translation, Korean translation, uh, I think the French people out there might be a little bit more forgiven, but I have no idea. Maybe. Gingembre. Okay. G-I-N-G-E-M-B-R-E. Okay. And Zingaberry. Now, I like Zingaber. I love it Zingaberry. Sounds, it sounds so zippy and wonderful. And, in fact, the rhizome of the plant Zingaber officinale is the OED's first definition for ginger. So oh, okay. the Latin has been kept in the botanical name for the plant. But I, I, I do feel a little bit I feel a little bit cheated that we didn't get zinger rather than ginger. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's not how etymology works, is it? So, having had a look, and OED basically says everything that Etym Online says in a slightly more formal way. It makes reference to the Dravidian potential root and the borrowing of that. It makes reference to the potential um, Sanskrit root and the fact that this may be an etymological sort of u-turn if you you like Mm -hmm. but then it also opened up to me the vast range of uses that this word has been given one of which i'm particularly interested in so here are our definitions for the word ginger we have first of all the rhizome of the plant you know the the food stuff that we are enjoying so much yeah particularly with garlic Mm -hmm. there is there are lots of obsolete uses of uh, uses of, of ginger so we have a post-modifying adjective, ginger, obtained from a particular place. So, ginger from Colam. Uh, Brazilian ginger. You know, various different places. So, right. it seems that that, as a habit, has kind of fallen out. We have other members of the Zingiber officinale family, which, you know, describes flowers rather than the, the root. So, there are a few different references here that that talk about the plant, the food, the root. However, we then get from 1779, a cock with reddish brown plumage, specifically one used for fighting. Hmm. So red cocks are called gingers. And I wonder, I, I I don't really know if this is the case, but I wonder if this perhaps then feeds into the notion that people with ginger hair are particularly fiery and feisty. Yeah. Now, is there any indication? Go? Well, it just uh, the thing that I'm curious about, and maybe you're getting to this, and if you are, just say, shut up and let me do my thing. But <clears throat> the thing that I've never quite understood is how ginger became synonymous with like a reddish orange, because that's not the color that ginger is. Like, you are uh, you are indeed treading on my toes a little bit, but okay, I will let you, you do it because I like you. <laughs> no, no, carry on. Well, I just... I. Yeah, well, that's that was just it. I was like, I I hope that you have discovered something about this because ginger, the ginger root, if you cook with it ever, is 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 yellow. It's kind of a whitish mm. pale yellow as opposed to, yeah, absolutely a red and you know. So yeah, what so what the OED has to no not at all what the OED has to say about this. So ginger referring to the color whichever color it is that that you choose to be referring to, this is sense number five in the OED of the word ginger. And we have A, B and C. So first we have a person with reddish, yellow or light orange brown hair, typically characterised by pale skin and freckles. More generally, any person with reddish hair, frequently Mm -hmm. as a nickname. So the variations of words that are used to describe people with red hair, there's a topic that we, we, we could talk about that for a whole episode. 
I wasn't aware of this, but in the Antipodean states, they like to call people with red hair blue, bluey. Really? Yeah. Now I know this because oh, this is this is Catherine's episode. Catherine is our friend. She lived with us in Korea. I hope she doesn't mind us talking about her on the internet. If she does, oops. But her maiden name was Jeans, and I remember her talking about the fact that this is particularly unfortunate for our brother because he has red hair. So he could have been blue jeans. <laughs> and now as I'm and now as I'm telling the story, I find myself absolutely doubting everything that I'm saying. So please, if this is incorrect, Catherine or anybody else who's listening who knows how to correct me, you know that way when you're saying something that you know to be true and halfway through you just get an absolute brain fart of insecurity that you're talking nonsense yes uh, as you're listening to it the words come out of your mouth you're like mm. uh, bleh, bleh, bleh. so yeah I, I believe that that's the the, the same also another uh, kiwi uh australian variation sometimes people will be called a rangar okay i presume as in ranger but pronounced differently and i, I find that one fascinating it's it's such a it's such an aggressive sounding word and i think it is usually used pejoratively Hmm. So, the next sense that, that OED has for this is a reddish yellow or orange brown colour resembling that of dried and powdered ginger. So, I started to think about, you know, as you say, when you think of redheads, personally, I think of that sort of carroty orange, really, really red, red hair. Yeah. But obviously, there are many, many different shades of, of red hair. Yeah. And. So when I had a look at this, I thought, well, powdered ginger isn't terribly ginger either. It's sort of pale brown. Yeah. So I I did then wonder if that is as a result of the quality of the powdered ginger or the distance that it travels from that sort of original rhizome. But yeah, I don't have I don't have any definitive reason as to why this spice and its not terribly orange colours have come to be it has come to be the name to by which we refer to people with red hair. But it, it is an interesting one. Mm-hmm. This sense C of this uh, particular definition is a cat with primarily orange coloured fur, typically marked with stripes of ginger cat. So I, I do wonder if there's just been a little bit of a mashup of their hair is a little bit like the colour of ginger even though it's not actually the same orange as an orange cat. There's something in common there with that hair colour and the orange cat, and that's called ginger. Therefore, they're all ginger now. Ha! Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, I don't know. Interesting. I wonder if ginger has just changed colour in the way that carrots have changed colour. I also wonder the same thing. Yeah, so carrots were purple, I think, originally. Yeah, they were like orange they carrots were didn't, come into, orange. didn't come into fashion until... The Dutch decided orange like is orange. our thing. Let's do orange yeah. now. So maybe but I don't the, know. <laughs> the first recorded sense of, of using ginger to refer to someone's hair or to refer to it as a nickname for a redheaded person is from 1823. Although I do I do wonder if oh, that is that's quite late. perhaps yeah, it does seem very late. So then we get a showy fast horse. A love lovely quotation, 1825. If you want to splash along in glory with a ginger. <laughs> and who doesn't? Well, indeed, I certainly do. We have ginger ale or ginger beer. And then, you know, always close to my heart, Scott's Colloquial, which I'd completely forgotten about because, well, what, what people forget about Scots is that although Scotland is a relatively small country, our language is huge. That's probably the same of anywhere. But mm. I do find it very, very curious that As a Dundonian living on the east coast of Scotland, there are words and phrases that I know to be particular to the area of Scotland that I live in, so particular to my city. I can drive for 15 minutes into Fife, Mm -hmm. which is a little bit further north, and encounter people whose colloquial native Scots tongue is almost unintelligible to me. Wow. You know, so within within such a small place, there are some really big differences between the the words that we use and the way that we use them. So ginger in this sense is very much a West Coast of Scotland habit. We don't talk about ginger in this way in Dundee. But in Glasgow, for example, a fizzy soft drink of any flavour is ginger. 
Wow. So so if you want to send someone out to the shop, say, to buy some sort of fizzy soft drink, you'd say, get me a bottle of ginger. Oh, that's interesting. Now, it's often it's often kind of folk etymologised that this is because of Scotland's most famous, certainly best loved fizzy drink, Iron Brew, right. which is nuclear bright orange. It's fantastically orange. Nobody knows why, don't ask. It, it can literally, you can use it to stain clothes. Like you could use it to dye clothes orange easily. <laughs> oh, I believe it. I'm unhappy with Iron Brew currently because thanks to the Scottish government's the UK government's attempts to save us all from the evils of sugar, right. Iron Brew have changed their recipe. So now instead of uh, tasting of delicious sugar, it tastes of disgusting sweeteners. Oh, that's terrible. And, yeah, you know, no one was ever drinking Iron Brew for good health. No. I was well aware that there was a ridiculous amount of sugar in it. I didn't drink it every day and brush my teeth with it. I would have it now and again as a sugary treat. Because However, that's what it was. That, yeah, yeah it's, it's dead to me now because I hate the taste of sweeteners. Oh, that's true. Really, North America went through a similar debacle and people younger, people I go to school with now, for instance, would have really no memory of this whatsoever. But in the 80s when Coca-Cola decided to change and they brought out the new Coke, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. they changed the recipe of like, <laughs> hey, there's this thing that's worked for us for a century. You know what we should do <laughs> is mess with it. Change it. <laughs> and they brought out the new Coke and everyone hated it. And that's why... Uh, at least for for decades, Coke like a, a can of just regular Coke was Coca Cola Classic. Uh, it was okay. to try to purge themselves of this debacle of the new <laughs> Coke. So uh, hopefully, Iron Brew will uh, will go back. I, for for people who are s- unfamiliar with Iron Brew, just a note for my fellow North Americans who may not I'm have sure. actually come across Iron Brew. To get your head around the color of of Iron Brew. <laughs> It's, it's like, like if, think the yellowish it's like if green Dew, of Mountain Dew. If Mountain Dew yeah. mated with blood. But but make that an orange. So picture the intensity of Mountain Dew, make it orange, and then turn it up. And then you get... <laughs> the. It's like people should just carry... They should have like those bandoliers like Rambo has of all of his ammo with just <laughs> bottles of Iron Brew instead of high-vis jackets. Yeah, that would work. Because you would see them forever. Yeah, Iron Brew, you know, it's it's such a Scottish institution and I, I really am a bit a bit unhappy that, they, that they've changed it. They actually, it's, it's just occurring to me just now that they introduced a ginger, a sort of a fiery Iron Brew, which Ross and I instantly nicknamed Fire Brew, because of course we did. <laughs> uh, and, and it was, it tasted like Iron Brew plus ginger beer. Oh. Yeah, it was good. So, so ginger, a fizzy soft drink, regardless of whether it's bright orange or not, uh, in in the east, sorry, in the west coast of Glasgow, right? Ginger is, you know, any any sort of fizzy juice. And then we come to the notion of being gingery, having a ginger temper, you know, mm. temperament. So yeah. OED calls it spirit, pep, energy, or temper. So having a bit of ginger about you. Get your ginger up, that kind of thing. Right. It's such a very satisfying word to say, ginger. It is. And it's a shame that I'm doing it down by saying I wish it was zinger and zinger, zinger, whatever. But uh, yeah, they they did well, but you know they could have done a little bit better. Yeah. It was also to continue. I told you this this word just just keeps on it giving. It just keeps giving. Yeah, it's an obsolete an obsolete use. I have a little bit. I start again and get that sentence <laughs> in an order that makes some sort of sense. <laughs> Gold dust. Oh. was referred to as ginger. So the quotation given from 1887, every night the books are balanced before the men leave, the floor is swept, and should there be a discrepancy, the dust has to be picked over for ginger, such being the technical word for the missing morsels. Oh, so yeah, it's quite, quite interesting. And then a usage that I I did not in any way have, have any awareness of, ginger slang, frequently derogatory and offensive, a homosexual man, short for ginger beer. I presume that this comes out of that sort of Cockney rhyme and slang type tradition and ginger beer and queer would be... Right, yeah. I, I, I presume it, it doesn't it doesn't make specific reference. I've never that heard that indeed. before in my entire life. That's no, no, I haven't either. So, yeah, we have red plumage on a bird. Mm-hmm. We have the hair colour, cat... A group organisation that provides spirit or stimulus in a party or movement that presses for stronger or more radical policy or action, chiefly in ginger groups. I'd never heard of this either. 
And then at the bottom, my, my absolute favourite, and when you showed me the picture of the Salty Words book yep. that you found, <clears throat> and I really hope we're going to hear some Salty Words soon. Oh, yes. Um, the, the, this made me think of, of the Salty Words. So the last usage given in the OED before we get into compounds is by ginger, a mild expletive, probably a euphemism for by Jesus or by God, now rare. Right. Not anymore. Yeah. That's all I'm going by to say ginger, from now on. By ginger, by gum, by George. The, the, by that same ginger. Sort of thing. Oh, that's fantastic. There, by ginger. I meant to give the merest hint of a sentiment and I have gone splash into a moral. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, surprisingly spicy, highly flavoured, delicious, versatile, both as a root, spice, and as a word. That's fantastic. Ginger. The other, there's another usage that I, like... When you said the, like, as in a temperament, mm. it's interesting. I mean, maybe this is a, a regionalism, but it, have you, to do something gingerly yes. is to do it kind of delicately and with trepidation almost. Like you take a bandage off gingerly so it's not I to can't cause believe extra pain. I, didn't, I, I can't believe I didn't consider that meaning. Yeah, you're I, absolutely right. But it seems like it's the opposite. Like maybe folk etymology alarms going off. I wonder if it's like if someone... If someone had a ginger attitude, they were prone to being excited or irritated. So you do something gingerly because you're doing it to avoid that. Yeah, but I, it's just an interesting turnaround from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm so annoyed that I missed that. I'm I'm busy having a having a wee look. Oh, do you know it has a completely different etymological journey. Well, that's just fine. Ve- you know, I, I I did a quick Google and the the top. I presume is Wikipedia. So we have Latin genitus into old French G E N T gent jolt. I presume where we get gentleman from. Yeah. Graceful. Old French gensor, delicate, which eventually became in the early sixteenth century, gingerly, which they gloss as daintily or mincingly. Oh, that's fantastic that it has yeah, nothing to do with so ginger. Nothing at all to do with, with the root or the spice. I'm so glad you brought that up. That's oh, that's fantastic. I, I find it, it it's fun how much like how finding a total lack of connection between two words that you really think yes. should be connected can be almost as much fun as finding a connection that you didn't know was there. Yeah, definitely. And that's it for this episode of Lexitecture. Thanks for listening, and if you enjoyed what you heard, please give us a rating and review on iTunes, and be sure to tell all your word nerd friends about us too. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter by searching Lexitecture, L-E-X-I-T-E-C-T-U-R-E. And if you'd like to get in touch with us about the things we talked about this episode, you can send us an email at words at lexitecture.com. Special thanks to the Joy Drops for our theme music, and we'll talk to you again next week. Bye.